Uh, and I've known Lisa Garcia Bidoya since she was a graduate student in political science at Yale. And it's really a thrill to uh, be able to have her as a colleague here at Berkeley. Um, Lisa is professor of social and cultural studies in the Graduate School of Education here at Berkeley and is also chair of Berkeley's uh, Center for Latino Policy Research. Uh, she's the author of award-winning books, including the recent Mobilizing Inclusion, Transforming the Electorate Through Getting Out the Vote Campaign. Uh, which was the winner of the uh, American Political Science Association's Ralph Bunch Award, as well as the Best Book Award from the EPSA's Race, Ethnicity, and Politics section. Uh, Professor Garcia Vidoya's research focuses on how marginalization and inequality structure the political opportunities available to members of ethno-racial groups, with a particular emphasis on the intersections between our race, class, and gender. So uh, she'll be offering our, our respondents' comments. Um, and following that, I just want to tell you that we will be having um, a session where we'll be able to do some Q&A and conversations. And we also have a reception coming up after this as well. So please stick around. Lisa. Thank you, Michael. It's funny, Karthik, I had just said the exact same thing about how shocking it is to have someone with such a giant field be such a tremendously decent human being. So, um, and I'm not just saying that because it's like, um, I'm going to try to be fast, especially since Michael just pointed out that I'm one of the things between you and wine at the end of this. So, and, and I think the more important issue is for you all to have an opportunity to ask questions, especially since there was a lot that, that was just presented, and I'm sure different things jumped out at different people. Um, but I wanted to begin by thanking. Uh, the National Asian American Survey, Asian American Studies, and HIFAS for, for sponsoring this. I think it's really important uh, to be giving people this information. And I, and I do want to give a tremendous amount of credit to my colleagues for the work that they've done over these last two election cycles, not just in terms of raising the money and getting this done, but really pushing our knowledge forward in how to survey Asian Americans, how to do it responsibly in a culturally competent way in order to actually get the most accurate information. And so the contribution is tremendous. And I think, I would, I would hope, I've been thinking that we need primers for people who work on campaigns on how, I've been surprised in my own experience with Latinos how few people understand the need for bilingual callers still, right? Or the need for um, good translation other than Google Translate, right? Or, or I, you think I'm kidding, but in fact, that's actually what they use. Um, so, but just to make sure that the information that's produced in our communities is of value and that it's an accurate reflection, since there's so little of it, what, what gets produced needs to be good. And I think you guys have done tremendous work on that and, and should help to inform the field. And I think it's especially important, um, Karthik brought up the CPS. Many people may not know, with the move away from the census long form, I just realized this this summer, we used to have, census used to do these nice sort of detailed summaries of different national origin groups based upon the 10-year decennial census. Now they're using ACS information, and there are, very, there are many fewer of them. And especially if you want national origin information on different Asian American populations or Latino populations, it's quite difficult to find. You have to use the standard breakdowns, which is sort of Central American, South American, that census, or you have to do the data analysis yourself. And so that move away from the long form has actually really decreased the amount of information folks can easily access about these populations. And so I think it's especially important to be able to know things about different national origin groups, and also to understand that the Asian American experience is, is geographically diverse, right? And, and, and that people look different across geographies. And so I think, again, you guys have made um, a really important contribution. And I just wanted to uh, piggyback, Karthik had mentioned looking at those demographics in terms of thinking about comprehensive immigration reform, just to explain, because the new reform program privileges high education, visa for high education high school workers, it's, it's, a, it's a great increase in those numbers of visas and a pretty significant decrease in the lower skilled, even though there are some in there. Um, the proportion of those visas that goes to Asian Americans versus other national origin groups across the world is much higher. So those numbers in terms of 40% of new migrants being Asian Americans should only increase exponentially if, if the Gang of Eight bill passes. And I think really thinking about what these different decisions about the kinds of people we're asking to come, what that's going to mean for um, what the population looks like in the future is important. Um, one thing I was just wondering about, and this is an open question, when thinking about impact on a campaign, you were talking about which 
elections Asian Americans had an effect on. And I'm just wondering, is there another way to do this? We have these arguments, you're part of the Latino C list. We have this very curmudgeon senior scholar of Latino politics named Rudy de la Garza. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fair, that's a fair, that's a, is that, I think, I think Rudy would be very happy to call the curmudgeon. I think he's totally yeah. fine with it. He, he does it purposely. But every election he sends out an email saying, we didn't matter. Right. And then everybody sends out emails back saying, well, we were this number of votes in this state and this number. And I just wonder if there isn't a way to frame it as what matters is that the electorate reflect the population that's actually, you know, being represented by our government, right? Rather than necessarily saying we only matter because we changed an outcome, but rather saying we matter because, in fact, we have a different set of interests and concerns that need to be reflected in the policy making progress process, even if we didn't make you win. I don't know if that might be a better way for us. I just, I think we get into this place of, was it 1.2 million votes or 1.1 million votes? And it, well, it's that there were votes, right? And that they have different um, concerns. And I think though, and the fact that those concerns aren't reflected in the current party structure, which is getting to Professor Lee's, oh, Tegu's, okay, fine, Tegu's, uh presentation, because um, I think it's the same, you know, Vietnamese and Cubans. If you can't win Vietnamese and Cubans, <laughs> right? You are, you are in trouble. Yes, you are in a lot, a lot of trouble. Because the policy perspectives, that's for me at least what's, what's important and I think parallel in terms of, of your findings. And, and Latinos, in a strange way, you're probably going to start getting the phone calls that we've been getting for the last five years saying, well, are they going to flip to support this candidate? And, oh, they're going to do Asian language advertising. I actually had an AP reporter tell me that because Meg Whitman was going to put $20 million into Spanish language advertising, of course she was going to win the Latino vote, despite the fact that she was on video saying horrible things about um, immigrants and, and undocumented folks. And this was even before the, the, the nanny um, situation. <laughs> And so, but there's a sense that we don't have, a, that, that there isn't a policy core to why we choose our parties, right? I think your findings really speak to the fact that even in this period of maybe where you may not identify with the party you say but you're voting, it's because of the fact there are policy concerns that align with, with what you're interested in. And I think that that's something that folks, at least in the media and whatnot, don't know yet and is another um, contribution that you guys are making. Uh, just a few other things. One of the things, so Asian Americans are the only population in the United States where there isn't a gender gap in voting. I would really like you boys to figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> we worked with Jane on this too, you know, but yes. And if anybody in the audience, because why? Every other group, women vote more than men, right? And so this is the only population, and across national origin groups, if I understand correctly from, from Jane, even within national origin groups, there isn't a gender gap. And so what is it about gender socialization among Asian Americans that leads you to have a gender outcome within the American context that's different from every other population? I think there's a paper to be written about that. <laughs> and our data sets um, publicly available to <laughs> what we can do. Boys can do it too. Yes. <laughs> Guys can do it too. But it's an interesting question because it speaks to sort of the, the, the multiple ways in which different life experiences get expressed through political choices. And I think this is a place where it looks like Asian American socialization is operating differently than it is for other populations. And it would be interesting, especially when we think of the importance of women of color to the Democratic coalition, where do we think Asian American women are going to be within that coalition? I think that that's um, important. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about a little bit about Tegu's uh, section. Because I'm wondering if, and, and, and dovetailing I feel like in Carmi's presentation, you know, we have a lot of people saying, I don't know. And then for the party question, you have a lot of people saying, I don't know. And I'm wondering how much of that is simply a reflection of the fact that the parties aren't speaking to the needs that are in a way that's relevant to these communities, right? That, that it, it's actually a reflection of, of a kind of um, exclusion from the agenda and exclusion from the conversation that makes it difficult to then have the information upon which to judge whether or not in fact they can that there's something similar in both of those, that, 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 that not knowing is in fact showing the degree to which the parties, it's not that there aren't any parties, it's that, that the parties aren't actually doing a whole heck of a lot to make the system intelligible to folks or legible to folks in a way that they, that they understand. And that it's, it's, it's more about the nature of the, of the conversation rather than necessarily the knowledge of that particular individual. It's in fact it's part of the structural problem. Because, again, this idea, and I'm wondering if you need an, another word. I, I think realignment is a very charged 
term within political science. And so the question is, there's not, there's not that much movement, right? It's that the population, it's not the party ID that's the moving part, right? Which is what was true in Southern Realignment, right? But it's really about these folks moving. And, and I think it, ju it simply reflects, and here's the, the more controversial point, the degree to which what we know about party identification in the United States is based upon white people. And we assume that that party identification didn't have a racial component. And now we're finding that party identification with other groups has a racial component, and we assume that the only place we have a racial component is with them. But in fact, whites are very clearly expressing a racial self-understanding through their party voting. And so in fact, what it is is more that we need to think about how racialized white party identification is and the degree to which it's expressed in similar ways in other, in other groups, and how racial identifications and interests, or senses of their interests, get incorporated into that um, attachment. The other thought I had to think about as you guys move to your geographic analysis is thinking about because so many Asian Americans are in post-progressive places, which basically means the areas where you have weak parties, you have a lot of nonpartisan office holding. Uh, for me as a, as a Californian, when I moved to Connecticut and I could go to a New Haven to vote and they still had the old machines with the levers and you can hit one lever and vote the Democratic ticket. Don't even have to think about it. Just, whip, you know, and as a Cal, that's unbelievable to me as a Californian. Right? And then you get very easy. Like parties exist in the East in a way. So maybe part of your New York blue is actually the different socialization experiences you have as an immigrant in a strong party system versus a weak party system and one that's so distant. You know, again, you can get a seat on the board of Alderman in New Haven with 200 people, which is one Italian and their extended family, right? <laughs> you, to get a seat in the LA County Supervisors, you're talking five million. Right? So it's a pretty it's a pretty big difference. So thinking about that, those those structures and how they affect, because I think the fundamental problem, I think what all of this reflects is we know very little about how people are socialized into politics, particularly in immigrant communities. We don't know how those processes happen. We don't know how sticky they are over time. And I think you guys have the opportunity as you keep doing these studies to really get that kind of longitudinal vision to be able to see how this works across, um, across generations. Um, one of the things I found interesting about the probabilities and if I read this correctly, even those that have pro positive Republican affect are still 0.5 likelihood of voting for Obama. Again, that's a bad sign to <laughs> be, right? If you have a five affect toward the Republicans, you still have, you're 50-50. Or it's a reflection of how bad a candidate Romney was, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, and then the last point about religiosity, I think, is, is also another, it's a nice parallel with Latinos. You know, Reagan said Latinos are all really Republicans because they're uh, anti-abortion and because they believe in family. And I believe um, Asian Americans probably were gonna, you're going to get the same, right? They're family oriented and they're also conservative. And I think showing the degree to which religiosity actually doesn't have that impact. And I think just to give a pitch for Janelle Wong's work, where she's doing work with um, Asian American evangelicals and showing that the degree to which the way we see religiosity and ideology connecting in the United States is in fact antithetical to how Christianity works everywhere else, right? That in fact, if you're a Christian, you believe in taking care of the poor, you believe in social programs, you believe in a whole set of things that are really religious don't. So again, thinking about religiosity and race rather than just religiosity in and of itself. And I think, again, you're, you're speaking to that. So I just want to um, put a pitch in for everybody to go to the website and, and look up the work, and I think um, having this kind of high quality information about a growing and important segment of the population is really important and I applaud all of the lost sleep and all of the uh, pitching you've had to do to make this happen and um, hope you are able to